Hi, everyone. It's uh, Saturday, April 3rd, 2021. And welcome, everyone. Our focus today is the pelvis and hips. And this is part of my anatomy and movement series for 2021. And um, I'm going to be doing two or three classes. This is one of them on the lower extremity, starting with the pelvis, the hip, and then climbing down the leg into the foot, having a section on walking in, future, in, in the next one or two classes. Today, the focus will be pelvis and hips. And our goals for today are to apply our anatomical understanding of the pelvis and hips to help increase our awareness and our ability to move. Hopefully the enhancement of understanding a little bit more about anatomy will also help you understand how to move more clearly in your own soma, in your own body. Um, we also, another goal is to increase the ease of movement in our hips and pelvis. We wanna release pain and discomfort, and we wanna increase flexibility and strength. We have our usual somatic guidelines, learn to move in comfort. That's a skill we need to develop. Most of us use too much force because that's the orientation we've come from, from exercise programs, no forcing. Uh, you need to learn to modulate your effort for less force, greater ease. Please back away from pain and follow any medical directives. We'll be starting in a chair. Um, uh, some people are seated on the floor and that's fine if it's easy for you to get to your pelvis and hips for a little bit of palpation and movement. It's definitely a little easier to do, to follow the palpation and the movement if you're in a regular chair with your feet on the floor where you can feel your sits bones, the bones you're sitting on, and you have a nice upright, comfortable upright spine and the crown of your head is facing up and your sits bones and crown are in alignment. We will be doing some self palpation shortly of our pelvis and hip area, and I'll be showing pictures. So between pictures and I'll be showing some of the palpation and hopefully you'll be following along with a palpating, which is touching or feeling yourself. So you know where anatomical areas, anatomical bony landmarks and bones are on you and in relationship to your space and your movement. And then we'll go on the floor and we'll have our floor mat and please have pillows and bolsters uh, ready as you might need them for support. Okay, so I'm gonna go into screen share now. And I am going to, um, let me minimize. Let's see if I can minimize that, okay. Let me see if I can, there it is up in the corner. Okay, so uh, this, so the lower extremity, um, is the lower extremity just from the hip joint down the thigh? This is the femur bone. Here's the knee, here's the knee joint, here's the kneecap, the patella, down the foreleg with the tibia and the fibula, the ankle joint and the foot and toes. Or is part of the lower extremity also the pelvis. It doesn't really matter what anybody decides the answer is. Uh, the hip joint is very dependent on the pelvis and in fact, the whole spine. And so I'm starting today's class on the pelvis and the hip joint. And then in future, the next in the next month or two months, we'll continue down the leg. You've, some of you have seen this picture before. Hold on, I wanna make this bigger. Okay, some of you have seen this picture before, but now I've applied it to the lower extremity. So our limbs, our arms and legs, those are our limbs, need the support and control of the spine and trunk to move with ease and efficiency. Remember the trunk consists of the spine, the rib cage, somatic center and pelvis. So I'm only showing the back of the body here, but the trunk, 
is basically kind of a rectangle. It includes the shoulder joints, the scapula, it includes the hip joints. And then the rib cage would be in the back. Here's the rib cage in the back with the thoracic spine. You have to picture the rib cage in the front and the breastbone in the front. And the somatic center, here's the lumbar area of the somatic center, and then visualize the front. The abdominal region is much larger in the front. The somatic center in the front is much larger. And then the pelvis, and here's the pelvis, here's the sacrum, the bottom of the spine, and the coccyx. And we'll be going through those. But just it's just looking at these pictures. And we use these pictures to look at the upper extremity, the arms and shoulders and scapulas. And now we're looking at the same pictures to see the lower extremity and the incredible versatility we have throughout our pelvis and our uh, hip joints and legs to do all kinds of things, these different parts of the golf swing, all these different movements in tennis. Of course, this is baseball. And the main point, you can pick apart the body all you want, but the body works as a whole. And um, uh, so even though today we're focusing on the pelvis and hips, as you view these pictures, notice the coordination, support, and versatility of the legs through the pelvis, through the hips and pelvis, and on up through the whole body. The whole body uh, needs to work synergistically. I need to spell make that needs. Anyway, we work as a whole. So let's look a little bit at a couple of pictures. So here's a picture of the front of the looking at the pelvis from the front, and here's looking at the pelvis from the back. And we're going to look at some bones and bony landmarks. This bone is called the ilium right here. This is the ilium. This is the ischium where our sits bones are at the bottom of the ischium. Here are our two pubic bones. We have two ilia. We have two pubic bones. In between the pubic bones is a um, disc, the pubic symphysis. And we have two ischia. So this is our ischium bone. And then from the back again, the ilium, the ischium. And if you look through, you know, it towards the front, now you're seeing the front of the pelvis right here. That is the, those are the pubic bones. And so we have these, the ilium, ischium, and the pubic bone. I'm gonna just quickly go back and forth between a couple of pictures. Here's the Here's our pelvis from the side. This is our hip socket called the acetabulum. And the three bones, the ilium, the pubic bone, and the ischium, they uh, come together. They, um, the, the sutures come together. And it, they don't completely come together until something like between six and eight years old. That's why we have to be careful of extreme sports in younger people. But the hip socket, contains all three bones. Okay, now here's where we can start doing a little bit of palpation. And uh, you, we wanna go to the iliac crest. So this is the iliac crest. And here, here it is coming towards the back. And if you just put your hands, you don't necessarily have to stand up, but you might be able to see me a little better where I'm putting my hands. If you find the soft part of you in the middle of your body and then come down and put your hands, come down, your, your hands will hit the top of your iliac crest on the side. Then I like to take my fingers once I have found it and I like to come forward. So I'm palpating myself and I wanna come to this ASIS anterior superior iliac spine. It's right here on me. It's a point that sticks out. It's a major, major bony landmark and you wanna be able to find it if you can. And then the iliac crest is subcutaneous. It's right under the skin. And so as you follow it backward, follow the crest backward, you'll come to the PSIS, PSIS, posterior superior iliac spine. It's another bump. Um, on some people, it's kind of flat. It's clearly a bump uh, on each side on my body. So I can clearly find 
my uh, post my PSIS. And you can see that from the back view, the, sa the sacrum is that triangular bone. Here you see it in the front, the triangular bone. And if you're on your PSIS, it might feel like to get onto your sacrum, you go just a little bit down, a little bit inward. And um, your sacrum has holes or foramina, that's where nerves come out. And then here's the coccyx or tailbone. And you can uh, feel, you can feel your sacrum. If you go right to the middle of your sacrum, it has a bony ridge, which is continuous with the bony ridge of the spinous processes in the spine, in the rest of the spine. And then you might be able to feel the lateral borders of your sacrum, the lateral borders of your, of your sacrum. Uh, women tend to have wider uh, sacrums and men tend to have narrower. So we did borders of the sacrum. The SI joints, the sacroiliac joints, okay. Your sacroiliac joints, very interesting. We're gonna be doing some movement that directly impacts the sacroiliac joint. Um, here's the sacroiliac joint where the sacrum meets the ilium bone. So we have two sacroiliac joints. This is the anterior view looking in through the body from the front. And then here's your sacroiliac joint. It's a deep joint. It's not easy at all to palpate, but you intuit where it is if you can find your PSISs. It's kind of where your dimples are. Right under the PSIS is the upper part of the sacroiliac joint or part of the sacroiliac joint. And you just have to kind of intuit where it is. The sacroiliac joint is not a voluntary joint. If I say, move your sacroiliac joint, you can't do it directly, but you can move other parts of your body and then it has impact on your sacroiliac joint. And there is a small amount of movement a very important movement in your sacroiliac joint. Then you have your sit bone. So as you're sitting, one of the things that I think is a nice thing to do is if you raise one hemipelvis up, you can come underneath and you can feel your sit bone on each side and you wanna orient. And if your chair is not too cushiony, you can actually feel, which is really nice for posture, feel your, sacro, uh, feel your sits bones and see if you're weighting them evenly, if you're sitting evenly on your sits bones. Okay, um, the coccyx or the tailbone, you can feel behind yourself. You can feel your coccyx, your tailbone. And then, um, what is the buttock area? The buttock area, this is the buttock area. Um, we'll look at that a picture a little bit later on. Uh, hemipelvis, what is a hemipelvis? A hemipelvis is half a pelvis. So here's one hemipelvis. And this is the other hemipelvis. So we have a right and left hemipelvis. And each hemipelvis can move in the uh, three planes of movement to a certain extent. Now the hip joints, the hip joints are a ball and socket joint and they're, the socket is very deep and it's in the pelvis. So here's your femur bone, the thigh bone, this has a neck, the femur has a neck, and here's the ball of the ball and socket joint. Here's the ball. The socket is in the pelvis, the ball is on the femur, and the ball fits into the socket. So very deep joints. Now, how do you find your hip joints? If you, they're not, you can't just palpate them directly. They're not like the shoulder joint. But if you go to the crease, at the top of your thigh, I call it the hip crease sometimes. If you go to that hip crease and you put your fingers in the middle of that crease, so you're in the middle of your thighs coming up onto your hip crease, 
under your fingers and deep, deep into the body, that's where your hip joint is. And if you keep your hands on your hip joint or one hand and you just move one of your legs a little bit, it doesn't even matter what direction, just a little bit, you might be able to sense a little clearer where your hip joint is, but it isn't really that easy to exactly sense the hip joint. We have to infer it with a number of different movements. Uh, so the thigh abdomen crease, that's what I'm calling the hip crease. And then we have the greater trochanter. This is the greater trochanter. And the greater trochanter is on the femur. It's not on the pelvis, but it is, um, it's on the exact side and if, if you start your hand flat of your hands up at the waist and come down, you'll hit a bony, like a big bony button. And it's usually considered the widest part of quote, the pelvis, even though it's not on the pelvis. That's your greater trochanter, lots of muscle attachment. Very important, greater trochanter, greater trochanter. This is your lesser trochanter. Lesser, tro not as easy to palpate. It's way deep in your inner upper thigh, but it's where the psoas muscle attaches. Very important pelvic muscle and somatic center muscle. And so the uh, lesser trochanter, at least intellectually, is a nice place to know. And let's just look at the joints of the pelvis. So we have a joint where the lumbar spine meets the sacrum, the, lumbar, the lumbosacral joint. We have the two sacroiliac joints. We have the hip joints. We have the pubic joint. We have the joint where the sacrum meets the um, coccyx. Most of these joints in the sacrum, they're all uh, welded together. In the sacrum, as we get old, I mean, the coccyx, as we get older, those joints also meld together. But sometimes when people are very active, some of those joints actually do remain active. A lot of joints in the, in the pelvis. And then we have the pelvic floor. I'm going to spend just a moment on the pelvic floor. This is looking down into the bowl of the pelvis. And this is looking from the bottom up through the pelvic floor. And it's a huge area, we don't realize. And it has many layers of muscles. And those muscles can get over contracted um, and cause a lot of pain. Um, and the, the pelvic floor is like a, it's like a diamond. So here's the bottom of the pubic bone. Here's the bottom of the tailbone or coccyx. Here's one sits bone, here's the other sits bone. This, these are the hip sockets. Th these are the sits bones. So we have this nice diamond for the pelvic floor. And there's uh, many exercises by different people have been created to work with the pelvic floor. We'll, if I can remember, I'll mention it as we do a few of the movements we're doing today. While we're in the chair, we're gonna do some basic movements and I'm going to stop the screen share um, and bring the focus back on me. And I am going to take you through uh, just the basic movements of the pelvis and hip from the chair. We're not gonna be doing this as a pendiculation. We're gonna be doing these movements as a flow, not super fast, but what I mean by a flow is that we're getting the sensory input about how to do the movement and where we are in space as we do the movement. So we're gonna start with the pelvis and we're gonna start with our arch and flatten slash curl when we do it in a chair. So as we inhale and arch and we come forward on our sits bones, our low back, especially our low back and our pelvis go into extension. And then as we come out of that, exhale, we come into more of a flattened curl. Now um, we're, we're going in the opposite direction. Our back is flattening more, our front is shorter. Uh, we're going into a flexion of our spine, especially our lower spine and our pelvis. So uh, extension, arch, flexion, 
curl or flatten, those are also pelvic movements and the pelvis is working as a unit. Both the right and left hemipelvises are working together. Now, as we're moving our sacrum, as you're doing your arch and your flatten, your sacrum also has some movement. It's called nutation and you don't really have to remember that at all. But when you are curling or flattening, you're going into sacral nutation, which is flexion. And when you go into the arch, you're doing counter nutation, which is the sacrum is extending. So the sacrum has a little bit of movement as in the joint, in the sacroiliac joint, as our pelvis is, is flexing and extending. Okay. Now, also, I want to say in the walking movement, when we walk, <clears throat> our, our, our one hemi pelvis comes more forward, and that's the leg that's going forward. One hemi pelvis goes backward, that's the backward leg. And of course, they change. So each hemi pelvis can work a little bit independently of the other and follow the movement of the legs. Now, when we come to lateral flexion, hip hiking, side to side motion, what we're doing, and just come along with me, what we're doing is we're, we are shortening one side, the pelvis is hiking up, this is your high side, the other side of your pelvis is your low side. And so we are, we are doing a, a um, C curve in the spine. A person can lean, but for a true lateral flexion, whichever hip is coming up, which in a chair means you have to put your weight in the other sits bone, you're gonna curve your ear to the same side as your hip that is coming up and your ribs are gonna contract. And now this is my high side, this is my low side. So the two hemi pelvises have a little bit of movement in the up down direction. And now we come to rotation. In rotation, for example, if you let one knee go more forward, your feet stay where they are, one, one knee comes forward, it's going to bring your pelvis forward like in forward walking. And this is my right side, my right pelvis is coming forward to the front and slightly turning left. I can bring my left knee and thigh forward, forward. Now my left hemipelvis is coming more forward. My right hemipelvis is going more backward. And so there's a forward backward movement. And the forward movement is actually a bit of rotation to the opposite side. The backward movement is a bit of rotation to the same side. Okay. Now my, 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 um, my pelvis can narrow across the front. If I knock my knees and squeeze my adductors, if I put my hands on my as is, is the ASIS, the, my hemi, two hemi pelvises are coming towards my midline. I'm narrowing across the front of my pelvis and I'm broadening in the back of my pelvis. If I externally rotate, my legs and I squeeze my buttocks, and you can do this in the chair as well, then I'm broadening or widening the front of my pelvis and I'm narrowing the back of my pelvis. So in this case, the two hemi pelvises are working towards a, an inward rotation or an outward rotation. The other thing I wanna say about um, rotation is that in a chair, if you bring your knees and thighs toward each other where you narrow your pelvis, you're opening your SI joint or gaping it, you're creating a gap, you're gapping it, you're creating more space in the SI joint and the SI joint has more room. If you externally rotate in your legs and your buttocks are narrowing in the back or squeezing together, you're compressing into your SI joints. And you're, so your SI joints have the ability to compress 
and to open, to compress and to open a little bit. And so depending on what you're doing with how your hip is functioning, you could be compressing, you could be opening in your SI joint or compressing in your SI joint. All very, very important. Let's go to the, the hips really quickly in the hips. If I, it doesn't matter that my knees are flexed, we're gonna, my, my hips are already flexed, but I can flex them more. I'm just gently flexing in my hips. Now, when I'm coming in this direction, I'm focusing on my hips. My hips are flexing, you can come along. Now, if I bring my leg behind me, which is hard to do in a chair, I'm extending my leg. However, in terms of direction, this is the direction of flexion. flexion. As soon as I start bringing my foot back down, I'm starting to move in the direction of extension. So I don't have to stand and completely get my leg behind me. This is flexion, flex, this is flexion, this is extension, 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 extension. As soon as I start to bring my hip forward, I'm in flexion, 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 flexion. Extension, 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 extension. These are directions for, then we have adduction and abduction. In adduction, I'm bringing one or both of my legs inward. My feet are remaining fairly straightforward. This is adduction, coming back to neutral, abduction. Coming back this direction is adduction. This direction is abduction. This is abduction. Let me get farther away so you can see. This is abduction. This is adduction. So ab and adduction. And then we have rotation. You can do it sitting or standing. This is Turning the thigh inward is internal rotation. Turning the thigh outward is external rotation. External rotation compresses the SI joints. It, uh, joint. Internal rotation opens the SI joint on that side. So we have the six ranges of motion in the hip. Flexion, extension, ab and adduction, internal, external rotation. Okay, let me go back to screen share. And I just wanna say something about the pelvic floor. A lot of, uh, especially women, but anybody who's um, incontinent, who can't hold their urine, uh, doctors will often give them kegels to do. And people over kegel and they get their pelvic floor too tight and now they have an array of all these other problems. So a kegel is a sort of a sucking up motion. You can do it as you're sitting there as if you're gonna hold your urine. You suck up a little, but you have to slowly let that release if you do it pendicularly, because you wanna release the, the uh, tension in the pelvic floor. So you gently contract or suck up or hold your urine. You slowly release and let the pelvic floor relax and lengthen. So you don't want to over kegel and you don't want to do these things like total force. It's just not okay. It does. It backfires on you. Just a couple more pictures and a couple more concepts. And then the last 45 minutes will be on the floor. Um, we're going to do movements that will involve the quadratus lumborum. It actually goes all the way to the, to the spine, but it's hidden by the psoas. This is your psoas muscle. It connects your lumbar spine to your lesser trochanter, connects your spine to your leg. It passes right through the pelvis. The quadratus lumborum, which is called the hip hiker, attaches from the 12th rib to the top of the ilium, and it hikes your hip. The oblique muscles are the major lateral uh, flexors and this is the external and when you bring your hands below your breast half on your ribs half on your belly and you 
turn to the right, your right external oblique is turning to your left. Here's my left. My left external oblique is turning me to the right. My internal obliques go opposite. My right internal oblique turns me to the right. My left internal oblique turns me to the left. But these, these fibers right on the side of my body, they laterally flex me. And you can feel them tighten if you do a strong C curve. And the psoas becomes important for a lot of people. It's, um, it's called a hip flexor. It, its function is to bring the leg forward and walking, not lift it so much as bring it forward from being behind you. Um, it's a body balancer. There's one on each side. And so we need quadratus needs to be balanced side to side. So as needs to be balanced side to side. And the obliques need to be balanced side to side for us to have really good side to side balance. Uh, the psoas is connected to our breathing. It connects to T12. The diaphragm uh, attaches to the bottom of the rib cage all the way around. Um, it's a spinal stabilizer when it's working well. Um, and we're going to be doing some psoas movement. And I can say a little bit more about that when we do it. But I just want to, oops, my picture's in the way. OK, I just want to say a word about resting length. We talk about um, one of the things that pandiculation does is it, um, is it brings you back into resting length. So here's the concept. Any muscle works better when its contraction starts from its full resting length. The two ends of the muscle attach to bones. Muscles move us because they cross one or more joints. Nerves must stimulate the muscle to contract. If my psoas muscle is nice and long in its resting length, I can get a full flexion um, of my hips. If I'm already contracted, or I'll actually show you this way. Let me come out of screen share. Let me show you on the biceps. If my biceps are already contracted and I can't straighten my elbows, I'm not in full resting length. And my elbows can only more, can only contract from where that resting length started. But when the resting length of my biceps is full, I've got the full journey I can do. I have much more flexibility and strength. So the longer your resting length is, that is in rest with your muscles not working, the longer those muscle fibers are, the more you're going to be able to fully contract and fully release back into resting length. Whoops, I almost quit the meeting. All right, I want to go back to screen share. Um, and I'm just going to show one more picture. And here's your glutes. And this is just a side view, gluteus maximus. Here's your iliotibial band. We'll be doing this in future classes. Here's your tensor fasciae lata. Um, I just want to say a word about sensory motor amnesia. We also call it MSA, motor sensory amnesia, and it's a loss of voluntary control and awareness. Let's say you hurt one of your hips. Now you limp a little and don't put your full weight into the hurt hip. You are using it less to protect it. It's sending less feedback to the motor cortex of your brain. So your brain starts losing its ability to fully sense organize and integrate it into regular movements such as walking. Over time, this becomes a habit, a chronic contraction pattern. Over time, you forget how to sense and move your hip. You've lost voluntary control and awareness. The technique of pendiculation is great to learn how to relearn how to gain voluntary control. Pendiculation teaches us to regain, relearn voluntary control again. Pendiculation works with the motor cortex of the brain. You must move slowly with awareness and with as much control as you can. There are two parts to a pendiculation, voluntary contraction of designated muscles, and part two, a slow controlled release out of contraction to your new resting length. 
This resets the resting level or resting length of the muscle. Okay, and with that uh, fairly extensive anatomical um, part of our lesson this morning, go ahead and get yourself ready to lie on the floor. We're gonna start on our back like we usually do. You may want support for your head. You may want support for under your knees. You wanna get yourself comfortable. You may wanna take off glasses, your belt, your a belt, money, wallet, things like that so you can rest comfortably. And it takes us different lengths of time to prepare ourselves to get on the floor. And as you begin to lie down on the floor and make yourself comfortable, you can begin to survey yourself and just notice one of the things you'll notice when you lie down on the floor, if you bring your awareness into your sacrum, you'll notice a certain amount of pressure on your sacrum. Sometimes I like to compare the amount of uh, pressure at the back of my head and my sacrum. It's often uneven when I first lay down and then after I do my somatic movements, the pressure between my head and my sacrum is often much more even. And if in areas of pain, remember to go slowly and gently do less, back away from pain, keep trying to make it more comfortable. And so we're gonna start with our knees bent and we're gonna move right into our usual opening movement of arch and flatten. So your knees are bent, your feet are on the floor. As you inhale, you're gently gonna walk, uh, arch your lower back away from the floor, your buttocks stay on the floor, you're rolling towards your tailbone. As you exhale, you wanna release your back, gently contract your abdominal muscles and your pelvis will now rock in the opposite direction. Just know that as you are moving back and forth in your arch and curl, your sacrum is also moving within your pelvis in that nutation, flexion, counter nutation, extension. If you bring your hands on the tops of your pelvic rim, uh, pelvic crest, iliac crest, as you arch and flatten, you'll notice that as you arch, the rim of your pelvis, your iliac crest go forward, and that's called an anterior tilt. As you exhale and flatten, the rim of the pelvis is going backward and that's called a posterior tilt. And if you're in the body work field, understanding uh, anterior and posterior tilt is referred to all the time in uh, various assessments and body work modalities. I like to end on flatten. Okay. You're, you're going to, we're going to do one leg at a time. Your working leg is bent. It doesn't matter if your other leg is bent or not. That's up to you. We're going to do an arch and curl, but as we do an arch and curl, I'm going to vary it a little bit. So you'll bring your hands behind your head. If you need to put pillows under your upper arm so that you can actually press your elbows back a little as part of the arch, that's fine. But don't hurt yourself if you, if you're, elbows are more in the air and you can't press them back, do not force. But using one leg at a time, you'll designate the leg. You're going to inhale and arch and on your exhale and curl, you're going to bring your designated, designated knee closer to your chest, closer to your elbows. That hip is, in more, is coming into even more flexion. You're gonna slowly, slowly, slowly bring that foot down. You're not going to repeat. You're going to lengthen that designated leg long. You're gonna let it slide long. And as you're sliding that leg long, you're actually going in the movement called extension, which is to straighten. So you're really straightening through your hip joint. Now with your designated leg long, as you inhale and arch, press that 
heel and leg down into the floor. And now you're getting more of an extension through your whole leg and through the whole upper trunk. Now, as you exhale and start going into a, a curl, a, a curl where you lift your head with your hands, start to flex your leg, lift your bent leg so your knee comes more towards your chest and elbows, get more flexion, and then slowly continue to breathe, slowly come out of that with your foot back on the floor, slide your leg along so that you get a full lengthened leg out of flexion. And then one more time, as you inhale and arch, press that designated leg down to get a more full extension through the hip and up through the trunk. Exhale, curl, your hands help lift your head, your elbows come closer together. You're gonna slide your leg into flexion, lift your bent leg, bring your knees and elbows gently toward each other. Slowly come down with your foot to the floor. You're welcome to lengthen it one more time. We're gonna to go to the other side. So your other side is gonna be your designated leg and your non-working leg can be straight or bent. That's up to you. It might be comfortable if you have any low back issues to keep it bent. Okay, hands behind your head. Your designated leg is bent. Let's start with it bent. You're gonna inhale and arch as you arch, your head goes back, your elbows go back, your tailbone rolls back if you can. As you exhale and curl, your hands help lift your head, your elbows come closer. You bend, you bend and lift your designated leg so your knees and elbows come a little closer together. Continue to breathe as you very slowly bring your foot to the floor and then gently slide your leg long, coming out of flexion into a straight extension. And repeat with your leg long now, as you inhale and arch head and elbows back, tailbone rolls back, pressing your leg down into the floor, full extension. Exhale, curl. Your hands help lift your head, your elbows come closer. You're bending that designated leg and lifting the bent leg, knee a little closer to your elbows. You're slowly coming down, foot to the floor. And now slide your leg long, coming out of flexion into a straight extension and rest, rest in any position that's comfortable. You can have your legs bent or straight. Since psoas is such an important uh, muscle for um, the organization of the somatic center and the pelvis hip, we're gonna do um, a very common psoas move you're gonna designate which leg is your working leg and that leg is long on the floor. Your other leg can be bent, it can be straight, it can be on a bolster. Your designated working leg is long. You're gonna very slightly externally rotate that leg so your toes come outward a little bit. And you're going to go ahead and gently lift that designated leg Listen, not more than two or three inches. It's not easy to do. And then you're gonna slowly bring the designated straight leg down. Now, if that was not comfortable on your back, I would bend your other leg and I would also do the move on an exhale. There's reasons why you might wanna do it on an inhale. There's reasons why you might wanna do it on an exhale and that's gonna be for a different class. Right now you're going for comfort. Once again, your straight leg with a little external rotation. If that was hard on your lower back, at least do it on an exhale. 
lift your straight leg not more than two or three inches. It is not easy to do that. It takes a lot of control and spatial relationship understanding and slowly release and relax. And we're going to switch legs. So now your other leg will be long, that's your designated leg. Your non-working leg can be bent or straight or on a bolster. You're gonna slightly external, externally rotate your straight leg. If there was any tension in your low back, for sure, at least do it on an exhale. And go ahead and lift that straight leg, not more than two or three inches, again, this is not an easy move to master and slowly come down. So many of us use momentum. Momentum is out of control. You, we are not using momentum. We are using control, slow movement. And you'll repeat the movement one more time, raising your straight externally rotated leg a little bit and slowly letting it release back down to the floor. And rest in a position of comfort. Okay. We're going to um, do an arch and curl that we call the flower. And we're gonna pay attention to what's happening in our pelvis, our, especially what's happening in our pelvis, hips and sacroiliac joints. So bend both knees. I like to do it one at a time, hands behind your head. And as you inhale and arch and press your head and elbows back and your tailbone down, both knees are going to rotate outward. You're externally rotating both legs and your buttocks will contract and you're compressing gently into your SI joints, into your sacroiliac joints where your sacrum meets your ilium bones. And then as you exhale, you're gonna to transition to a curl. You're going to spread your feet wider and bring your knees toward each other. Your hands are gonna help lift your head. Your elbows are coming closer to each other. Your feet are gonna stay on the floor, but you're bringing your knees and inner thighs toward each other. You're internally rotating in the uh, legs and hips you're narrowing the pelvis in the front and you're opening up your SI joints gently. And then finding an inhale, if you had to take some breaths in between, you start transitioning slowly into an inhale and arch. I like to bring my feet together and my knees out. I'm going into a full arch. My knees are going outward. My hips are in external rotation. I'm gently compressing into my SI joints in my buttock area where the sacrum meets the ilium bones. And then last one, you'll slowly transition. You'll find an exhale. On the exhale, as you curl the upper body, hands help lift the head, elbows come closer, splay feet out, gently squeeze knees and thighs together. You're internally rotating hips and thighs, hips and legs. You're opening up your SI joints. Slowly come down and relax. That is the flower. and rest. And now turn on one of your sides. I like to grab a pillow for under my head, but you can also use a bottom arm. That's up to you. And you're going to assume what we call the chair position. Both knees are bent, stacked on top. Both legs are bent, stacked on top of each other. You're about at 90 degrees hips, 90 degrees 
knees, your ankles are under your knees. And once you're in that position, go ahead and straighten your top leg. And you're going to gently bring your straight leg, it's gonna straighten straight downward. And you're gonna gently bring that leg up toward the ceiling a little bit. You are abducting your leg. And then slowly bring it back down. As you bring it back down, if you need to gently bend your knee a little, that is fine. Now, here's what I'd like you to differentiate. With your straight leg, as you slowly start to abduct, bring your leg up just a little bit. You're abducting at the hip. The higher you bring the leg, and don't hurt yourself, the higher you bring your leg, the more you'll also start to hip hike. And so now what started out as abduction in the hip is added to by the lateral flexion in the pelvis and slowly bring your leg down. Now keep your leg long or fairly long and bring your hand over your head. And we're gonna do our lateral flexion move, but with a long leg. And notice as you begin to bring your straight leg towards the ceiling and lift your head so your armpit and hip come together, you're doing a combination of abduction at the hip joint and lateral flexion through the pelvis and somatic center. And slowly release back down. So there's a differentiation and an, and an integration. And one more time, do it slowly. When you first start lifting your leg, you're in abduction. Then as your armpit, your head will lift, uh, your hand helps lift your head. As your armpit and hip come closer together, now your obliques and some your quadratus lumborum are playing a much larger role and you're combining abduction of the hip with lateral flexion of the pelvis and somatic center. And slowly come down, relax, let your arm relax and let your top knee bend again, stacked on your bottom leg. Now, you're gonna straighten your bottom leg and your top bent leg is gonna be in front of your bottom leg. And if you're more comfortable with a pillow under your top bent knee, that's fine. Your bottom leg is straight, your top bent leg is in front of your bottom leg. Now gently, we'll do adduction of the hip. You're gonna gently raise your bottom straight leg toward the ceiling. You are adducting your bottom hip and leg through the leg and slowly come down. Now bring your hand over your head, your top arm over your head again to help lift your head. Now this time, and you might need to, um, no, we're gonna do it this way. Now what's interesting, we're gonna combine adduction of the bottom leg with our lateral flexion of our upper body. Your top leg stays bent on the pillow or on the floor. So as you, laterally flex, lifting your head with your hand, your armpit and top hip do come closer together and your bottom leg lifts because your bottom side of your body is long. The top side of your body is short. It's a lateral flexion with your bo bottom leg doing adduction and slowly come down. And just one more time, you're going to be doing lateral flexion with adduction of your bottom leg. So you're going to, your, your top armpit and hip are coming closer together. Your top leg is staying bent and in front of you and your bottom leg is adducting and it's contributing to the lateral flexion of the top side, the side that's facing the ceiling and release and relax. And in this position, we're going to do a little bit of pelvic rotation. 
So go ahead and stack your knees again, one on the other, but I'm going to suggest that you bring your knees down a little bit. So it's not at 90, 90, but it's less than that. I find when I do this, it's a little easier if I, if my, uh, both knees are still stacked and bent, but um, I, I'm lower than uh, 90 degrees to my hips. All right, now you're going to be rotating your pelvis, your somatic center is going to be coming along. And for some of you, your head and your trunk are going to come along too, and that's fine. What you're going to do is start sliding your top thigh and knee forward of your bottom thigh and knee, start turning your pelvis, the top side pelvis, hemipelvis forward toward the floor. Let your top leg slip off of your bottom leg if you can, so you can actually turn the top, your, the top hemipelvis more forward toward the floor, and you are rotating your pelvis forward and to whatever side that represents for you. And then slowly come back to your neutral. Now you're going to rotate your pelvis in the opposite direction. Start to bring your top leg straighter and behind you. It doesn't have to completely straighten. It may or may not, but bring your top leg straighter and start to bring it behind you and let it rotate your pelvis now so that it's rotating backward and the front of your, your navel is going more toward the ceiling. And now your pelvis is rotating backward and is turning whatever direction that represents for you. And slowly come back to your neutral. And we're gonna put that together a little bit more uh, as a flow, but very slow. I call it a slow flow pendiculation instead of a true pendiculation. So you're gonna start sliding your top thigh and knee forward of your bottom thigh and knee, and you're gonna start letting your knee and thigh slip down onto the floor. Mine usually comes above my other thigh, and my, it helps me to turn my pelvis the top hemipelvis is turning toward the floor. Now, as I come back, I start straightening my top leg. And as I start bringing my straighter top leg backward, it starts turning my pelvis backward now. And I'm rotating and turning my top hemipelvis the opposite way. Now from here, you're going to start bringing your top leg, it may be straight-ish, you're gonna start bending that knee and bringing it forward over your bottom leg, letting your pelvis turn more, top, top hemipelvis turn more toward the floor and your top thigh and knee come a little forward of your bottom. And then last one, start to straighten your leg more and bring it behind you and let that open up your pelvis to turn your pelvis backward. And then slowly come back to your neutral and rest. In a future class, we will combine that movement with upper body going both in the same rotation and in the opposite contralateral rotation. Okay, go ahead and turn on to your other side. You're going to gently stack your knees comfortably ankles under your knees, bottom pillow under your head or bottom arm under your head, whichever you find most comfortable. Do not force, do not overdo. You can always do the movement in your imagination. Gently straighten your top leg or straighten it to the extent you can. And you're going to slowly lift your top leg toward the ceiling. You are abducting your top leg at the hip 
the higher you go, the more you'll recruit your lateral flexors, your oblique muscles in quadratus lumborum. Slowly come back down and rest. Bring your top arm over the top of your head, okay? Because you're gonna lift your head now. We're gonna combine the lateral flexion, but we're gonna do it with a straight leg or straightish leg. What you're going to do as you bring your leg up toward the ceiling, you're starting in abduction as you lift your head and your armpit and hip, top armpit and hip are coming closer together. You're combining it with lateral flexion hip hiking and slowly come down. It's just a lateral flexion with your leg in at, with your leg coming from abduction. And one more time, even less, you'll feel more when you do less and go slower. So you're gonna gently lift your head a little bit if you can, armpit and hip come toward each other, top leg lifts a little bit. So you're integrating abduction into and lateral flexion together. And then slowly come down and relax. You can let your arm rest for a moment. Now we're going to combine lateral flexion with adduction of our bottom leg. So you're going to lengthen your bottom leg. You're going to keep your top, you're going to bend your top leg in front of your bottom leg. Many people like to put a pillow under the bent knee of their top leg. That's fine. You want to be comfortable. Your bottom leg is straight or straightish. Go ahead and lift your bottom leg. That's adduction. It might be a very small movement. That's fine. You're using your adductors, your inner thigh muscles of your bottom leg to adduct your bottom leg at the hip, at its hip, and slowly come down. Now we're going to combine that with lateral flexion. So bring your hand back over your head. Breathing comfortably, you're going to start gently lifting your head a little bit. Your armpit is coming closer to your hip, your top hip closer to your armpit, and your bottom leg is adducting to help the lateral flexion. Your bottom leg is adducting and slowly come down. So you're doing a lateral flexion of the top of your top side with adduction of your bottom leg and go ahead and do that one more time. Lateral flexion with adduction of your bottom leg. And if it's too much, just a little bit of adduction perhaps. Do not overdo. Okay, now rest on your side for a moment. And we're going to go into the pelvic rotation we did on the other side. I like to um, bring the angle of both of my bent stacked legs a little bit down. I, I don't, the 90-90 is not as comfortable for me as I like to bring it down a little bit. What you're going to do, you're going to be rotating your pelvis forward toward the floor. And you're going to do it by starting at your top thigh and knee is starting to come forward uh, along or slightly maybe above your bottom thigh and knee and start to fall off the top, the bottom, your top thigh and knee are going to start falling off the bottom thigh and knee and your pelvis, it's going to bring your pelvis, your top hemipelvis is now going to start turning, rotating toward the floor and you're rotating your pelvis. Now, you're going to start to straighten your leg. It doesn't have to go completely straight and bring your top leg backward behind you if you can. And as you start to straighten and bring your top leg behind you, your pelvis is now going to roll backward and you're going to, your navel is going to come more toward the uh, come more toward the uh, ceiling. 
And then you're gonna start rotating your pelvis forward. So as you come forward, your top leg starts to bend at the hip and the knee. It starts sliding forward of your bottom thigh and knee and starts falling toward the floor and your top hemi pelvis start continues to rotate toward the floor you're just going in comfort and your hemi pelvis is now rotating forward and toward the floor and now as you go backward you start by straightening your top leg more it doesn't have to go completely straight you're straightening your top leg more and bringing it backward behind you. That's going to bring your top hemi pelvis backward. And now you're turning your hemi pelvis backward. You're rotating it backward. Go ahead and see if you can do one more set on your own where that you, as you start coming forward, your knee and hip will bend and start sliding forward and downward toward the floor, your top hemi pelvis will rotate and turn more toward the floor. Then you'll start straightening your top leg more and bringing it behind you and letting it bring your top hemi pelvis backward, now backward toward the floor behind you. And this is the kind of rotation, the forward backward rotation that's required in walking. And then come back to uh, on your side comfortably for a moment. In a future class, this is one of them that we'll be combining with our upper body, rotating our upper body with our lower body both in the same direction, which is ipsilateral and contralaterally, which is opposite upper and lower body. So turn over onto your back and rest. And we're going to move into um, probably our last floor movement for today. We are gonna continue pelvic and hip movements N next month. We're gonna continue the theme of this class for one or two months. I think right now I realize it's gotta be at least two more months, that's okay. And we're going to do a version of arch and curl on the diagonal, but it's yet again a different variation than our usual one. So on your back, bend your knees, feet on the floor. And if you can, bring your um, left heel ankle area onto your right knee. Your knee will stick out to your left. If you cannot do that, then you can just leave both feet on the floor. But if you can do that, your left ankle heel area somewhere close to your right knee or on your right knee. Now in your lower body, let your arms be out of the way, probably on the floor. You're going to take this configuration and you're going to, leaving your, your left ankle on your right knee, you're going to bring both knees toward the left. And you are bringing your weight shift into your left hemi pelvis, and now come back through neutral and to the right. And now your weight shift is bringing both hemi pelvises I mean, your, your, I'm sorry, your, your uh, going onto your right hemi pelvis is holding your weight and your left hemi pelvis is more up in the air. Go back and forth a little bit slowly and notice that as your knees go to the left, 
your left leg is externally rotating, your right leg is a little bit more into internal rotation, you you're rotating in your pelvis to the left, you have a weight shift. Then as you start to bring your knees back to the right, your weight shift is, your weight is going into your right hemipelvis, your left hemipelvis is lifting, your right uh, hip and leg are going into external rotation, you're left a little bit into internal rotation and come back to your neutral. If you need to undo your legs, you can, but we're gonna come back into this position, but sometimes people need to rest. Okay, bring your left ankle heel area again on your right thigh. Same position, all right, now, you're gonna bring your right hand behind your head, your right hand behind your head. You will not be lifting your lower body at all in this move, but you will be on the curl, be lifting your upper body. So with your right hand behind your head, you're going to inhale, turn your face to the right. You're going to inhale and start to look as if you're looking over your right shoulder, your elbow will go down, bring both knees to the left. You're in a, a diagonal arch and curl position, but you're not, you're not lifting your lower body. Now, as you exhale and find a curl, both knees go to the right. Your right foot stays on the floor, but you're going to let your right hand help lift your head and you're turning your face and your upper body to the left as you curl. And your left hip and right shoulder are coming toward each other and it is the contracting diagonal in the front. And then you're going to come out of this and back into your arch as you inhale, you're looking to the right, as if you're looking over your right shoulder, right elbow back, knees to the left. And now between your left hip and your right shoulder is the long diagonal and the short contracting diagonal is in the back. And then one more time, uh, exhale and curl, knees to the right, upper body, lifts, your hand helps lift your head, right elbow and face turn left, right, your trunk turns towards the left. And slowly come back to your neutral and uncross your legs and rest for a moment. And now you're going to bend your knees if they've come out and you're gonna put your right uh, ankle heel on your left knee. If you cannot do that, both feet can just be on the floor and your knees can still go from side to side. So your right heel ankle on your left knee and gently bring both knees to the right, your weight, you have a weight shift into your right hemipelvis, your left hemipelvis is lifting, your right leg is going into external rotation, your left leg a little bit into internal rotation. And then you're gonna to start to go into the opposite direction. And now as your knees, both knees go to the left, you're rotating your pelvis to the left, your weight is going into your left hemipelvis, your right hemipelvis is lifting, your left leg is going into external rotation, your right a little bit of internal rotation and come back to center. So our knees are gonna be going back and forth. Bring your left hand behind your head if that's a comfortable thing to do. Now, as you inhale, it's on an arch, your face turns left. It says, if you're looking over your left shoulder, it's just a direction, your left elbow goes down, your knees to the right. Now from the left shoulder to the right hip is your lengthening diagonal. Your left shoulder and right hip are coming away from each other in the front and in the back, it's your short diagonal. And now as you exhale and curl, your knees are going to the left, your left foot stays on the floor, but you're going to raise, let your hand help lift your head and you're gonna turn your trunk, your rib cage, your face 
and your left elbow toward the right. And now between your left shoulder and right hip, you've got your short contracting diagonal. And in the back between your left shoulder and right buttock, you have your lengthening diagonal. And go ahead and see if you can do that one more time. Your knees will go right. Your upper body will turn to the left as, as if you're on an inhale, looking over your left shoulder. It's just a direction, don't force it. And then as you exhale and curl, your left hand helps lift your head. Your upper body lifts and curls to the left as your lower body rotates to the right. And this is a contralateral rotation with your upper and lower body going in opposite directions. And you've got a short and long diagonal front and back in the body. And then come to neutral. We've gone one minute over and just rest in any position that's comfortable. You might want to check into the weight on your sacrum and the weight on the back of your head. Perhaps it has evened up if it wasn't even. It's whatever's true is true. You want to try to assume the position you were in at the beginning. So if your knees were bent at the beginning or if your legs were straight, you want to try to come back to the same position so you have a means of comparison. And just enjoy the sense of relaxation in yourself, in your soma, in your body. And let me just give you some further instructions. <clears throat> Officially, I need to end the class on time, but I'm going to stay on. And if you have a little time to roll over gently and walk around a little bit, I would suggest that. I will stay on the line as people walk around. And if you wanna also stay and comment, or if you have questions, I love to stay after and have a chat with whoever likes to stay on. So that is going to end the first of probably three. Now I'm thinking maybe it'll take four classes, I'm not sure. But our theme is um, the, the lower limbs starting today with the pelvis and the hips. Uh, in May, we will come back to the pelvis and the hips and continue on with more movements to understand hip pelvic movement. And over time, we will climb down all the way to the feet and have a section, one class will have a section on walking. So go ahead and walk around if you have time. And so la -di da walk. A la -di da means you're just walking freely. Your arms are gently swinging. You're not going too slow and you're not going too fast. You're just letting the movements you've been doing and the information you've been gleaning, you're letting that all integrate into you as you integrate into standing and walking from the movements and the concepts we've been working with in today's class. Thank you very much.